Bless the Lord who forgives all our sins. God's mercy endures forever. Hear the commandments of God to God's people. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of bondage. You shall have no other gods but me. Amen. Lord, have mercy. You shall not make for yourself any idol. Amen. Lord, have mercy. You shall not invoke with malice the name of the Lord your God. Amen. Lord, have mercy. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Amen. Lord, have mercy. Honor your father and your mother. Amen. Lord, have mercy. You shall not commit murder. Amen. Lord, have mercy. You shall not commit adultery. Amen. Lord, have mercy. You shall not steal. Amen. Lord, have mercy. You shall not be a false witness. Amen. Lord, have mercy. You shall not covet anything that belongs to your neighbor. Amen. Lord, have mercy. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on us. Forgive us all our sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen us in all goodness. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep us in eternal life. Amen. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, you know that we have no power in ourselves to help ourselves. Keep us both outwardly in our bodies and inwardly in our souls, that we may be defended from all adversities which may happen to the body and from all evil thoughts which may assault and hurt the soul. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. A reading from 1 Corinthians. The message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since, in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, God decided through the foolishness of our proclamation to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks desire wisdom, but we proclaim Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those who are the called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. 
For God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom, and God's weakness is stronger than human strength. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. Thanks be to God. Our psalm appointed for this morning is Psalm 19. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows God's handiwork. One day tells its tale to another, and one night imparts knowledge to another. Although they have no words or language, and their voices are not heard, their sound has gone out into all lands, and their message to the ends of the world. In the deep has God set a pavilion for the sun. It comes forth like a bridegroom out of his chamber. It rejoices like a champion to run its course. It goes forth from the uttermost edge of the heavens and runs about to the end of it again. Nothing is hidden from its burning heat. The law of the Lord is perfect and revives the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure and gives wisdom to the innocent. The statutes of the Lord are just and rejoice the heart. The commandment of the Lord is clear and gives light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean and endures forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold more than much fine gold, sweeter far than honey, than honey and the comb. By them also is your servant enlightened, and in keeping them there is great reward. Who can tell how often he offends? Cleanse me from my secret faults. Above all, keep your servant from pre presumptuous sins. Let them not get dominion over me. Then shall I be whole and sound and innocent of a great offense. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my Redeemer. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. Glory to you, Lord Christ. The Passover was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple, he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and the money changers seated at their tables. Making a whip of cords, 
he drove all of them out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. He also poured the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. He told those who were selling the doves, take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. The people then said to him, what sign can you show us for doing this? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. The people then said, this temple has been under construction for 46 years and will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. I come to you in the name of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. The morning's gospel story about Jesus' disruption at the temple makes a whole lot of people a whole lot of uncomfortable. It has made folks uncomfortable for the past 2,000 plus years, especially church folks. I know this because as far as I can tell, there is not a single hymn in either of our hymnals specifically about this holy protest. Out of all the prayers in our Book of Common Prayer, there is not a single mention of this direct action. And during Holy Week, we march with Jesus into Jerusalem. We pray with Jesus in the garden. We walk with Jesus to the crucifixion and we rejoice with Jesus at his resurrection. But the temple cleansing does not get even an honorable mention. Even the title that we give this story, a title not found in scripture, by the way, speaks to our discomfort with the whole episode. We give it a nice clean title. We call it the cleansing of the temple. But let me tell you, this ain't no parish work day. Jesus did not enter the holy space with a swiffer to drive out the grime on the pews. He invaded the holy space with a whip to drive out the profiteers selling doves. This morning's story has a history of making folks uncomfortable, and I'll be honest with you. Today, Jesus makes me a little uncomfortable. Jesus makes me this morning because when I see what he was doing in AD 31 at the temple, I can't help but think about what we all saw happening on January 2021 in our nation's capital. Now don't get me wrong, I am not saying that Jesus' temple demonstration should at all be equated with January's attempted insurrection. The storming of the capital was based on a big lie, while the disruption of the temple was based on God's truth. The storming of the capital was about silencing the voice of the people, while the disruption at the temple was about heeding the voice of God. The storming of the capital was rooted in white supremacy, while the disruption of the temple was rooted in God's justice and in God's mercy. The protest at the temple was not the mob at the Capitol, but it still makes me uncomfortable because I've got to imagine that many of the good citizens in Jerusalem experienced some of the same feelings about Jesus' invasion of their sacred holy space that you and I experienced about the mob's invasion of our sacred civic space. Sure, the temple had been co-opted by the empire. 
Sure, the temple had not lived up to its full potential. Sure, the temple did not always employ the most scrupulous priests and public officials. But the temple was still essential to the people's identity. It was still believed to be the location where heaven and earth collided. It was still the institution with a sacred history that could be traced all the way back to King Solomon. It was still a space where you could find healing, forgiveness, reconciliation, and grace. It was still a place of significant importance that the people respected. And so I bet you can imagine the uncomfortable feeling that some folks experienced back in Jerusalem when Jesus invaded and disrupted the temple. Because you may have experienced a very similar uncomfortable feeling when the mob invaded and disrupted the capital. If you take a close look at some of the details of the text, your uncomfortable feeling might grow even stronger. You'll notice that Jesus used a whip to drive out the money changers, and he overturned more than a few tables. Now, I'm not saying Jesus used violence, but at the very least, he brandished a deadly weapon and damaged public property. You'll also notice that the people who had every right to be in that space, the priests, the staffers, the dove sellers, and the money changers, the folks wearing official name badges, those who were granted the proper security clearances, they all had to evacuate their offices. Which tells us that this must have been a premeditated action that involved a whole mess of people. Logistically, Jesus could not have cleared the temple on his own in a spontaneous fit of rage and anger. This was a big space with a whole lot of people guarded by a whole lot of police. So this protest must have been large and it must have been organized in advance, scheduled specifically to happen on the Passover celebration during a time that would cause maximum disruption. But the thing that the citizens of Jerusalem might have found most unsettling about Jesus' storming of the temple was that Jesus interrupted some of the activities that were essential to the people's religious devotion and civic participation. You see, if you wanted to fulfill your patriotic duty by paying the temple tax, you needed the service of the money changers who would exchange your idolatrous Roman coins for ones without the image of the emperor. Kind of like if you want to play the arcade games at Chuck E. Cheese, you need to exchange your quarters for special tokens. And if you were from out of town and you wanted to make the proper sacrifice at the temple, the folks selling doves, sheep, and oxen provided a valuable service. Instead of trying to fit an ox in your minivan next to your three kids, for the trip to Jerusalem, you could just buy what you needed once you got to the temple. Money changers and dove sellers were essential workers. They made sacrifice possible. They were, you might say, part of business as usual. I believe it's safe to say that Jesus' storming of the temple was not universally popular. It was an, an inconvenience for those traveling to Jerusalem for Passover. It was a disturbance for those who appreciated law and order. And it was a major disruption to business as usual. It surely made a whole lot of people uncomfortable. But my friends, I'm pretty sure that that was kind of the point. You see, the good upstanding citizens of Jerusalem had gotten comfortable with dove sellers and money changers. They had come to view them as essential components of a system that made religious observance convenient and possible, but the problem was that they were ripping off the people 
especially the most vulnerable. You see, Jesus believed that the temple was supposed to be a place where the people could come and receive God's grace. But the dove sellers and the money changers were using it as a for-profit enterprise. If you needed a healing, you had to pay the dove sellers, even if you were broke. If you needed forgiveness, you had to see the money changers, even if it cost you your last cent. If you needed a vaccine, you had to pay the dove sellers, even if you did not have the time to keep clicking refresh or didn't have the gas to drive to Poplar Bluff. If you needed to participate in the rituals necessary for full membership in your community, you had to see the money changers, even if the only money you had to exchange was the change you had in your pocket. Dove sellers and money changers were essential to business as usual, but business as usual blocked the people from the resources they needed to live and to flourish. The good citizens may have believed Jesus' actions were radical, extreme, and a little over the top. And who knows? Maybe they were. Jesus' disruption of the temple might have been a radical move. It was most definitely an inconvenience. But the things that Jesus wanted weren't really extreme at all. He wanted folks to be treated with dignity and respect. He wanted poor folks to have a slice of the kingdom. He wanted hungry people to be filled with good things. He wanted parents to have the resources they needed to feed and clothe their children. He wanted everyone to have access to the same sort of things that most people want for themselves and their families including the good citizens of Jerusalem. But business as usual left a whole lot of folks out. Business as usual valued profits over people. And so Jesus disrupted the temple to draw attention to the evils of business as usual. Even if that disruption made more than a few good citizens in Jerusalem uncomfortable. Just last month, the Missouri State Senate passed a piece of legislation called Senate Bill 26. This bill is a direct response to some of the uncomfortable things that Jesus did last year to bring attention to the evils of business as usual. Jesus blocked a few interstate highways to bring attention to the evils of systemic racism. Jesus called for the removal of racist monuments, flags, and symbols from our public spaces to bring attention to the evils of white supremacy. Jesus organized protests and mass demonstrations in towns and cities across this nation, including my hometown of Flora, Illinois, to bring attention to the evils of economic and racial inequality. I can testify to these disruptive, disruptive actions because I witnessed firsthand Jesus doing some of them. And I'm sure that some of the good citizens of Jerusalem found them uncomfortable, inconvenient, and maybe even a little radical. The fine folks in Jefferson City surely did. They found them so uncomfortable that they passed a bill that, among other things, makes it a felony to block traffic in a so-called unlawful assembly. Senate Bill 26 would, in other words, criminalize the actions of Jesus, kind of like Pontius Pilate did 2,000 years ago. Turns out that our elected officials are more concerned with the flow of traffic on Hampton Avenue than they are with the flow of vaccines to the elderly, the flow of fair wages to working families, and the flow of justice to our communities. The good news is that as long as business as usual puts profit over people, Jesus will keep making the good citizens of Jerusalem uncomfortable. 
regardless of the legislation that Pontius Pilate might pass. And if you want to keep Jesus from getting a felony, then I invite you, I encourage you to fill out the petition in opposition to Senate Bill 26 that I'll be dropping into the Facebook chat right now. If you're watching this video via the website, you can find a link to the petition directly below this video. As long as business as usual keeps God's children from flourishing, Jesus will keep making the good citizens of Jerusalem uncomfortable. Sometimes Jesus might make you, he might make me, he might make us uncomfortable with some of his actions. And if and when that happens, I invite you to remember that Jesus does what he does, not simply to make you uncomfortable, but to advance a kingdom that should not be viewed as extreme or radical. Jesus disrupts business as usual because he believes that black lives matter. And that's not radical. Jesus disrupts business as usual because he believes children should have three healthy meals a day. That's not radical. Jesus disrupts business as usual because he believes sick people should have access to a doctor. That's not radical. Jesus disrupts business as usual because he believes working families should be able to pay the bills. That's not radical. Jesus disrupts business as usual because he believes people should be treated with dignity and respect. That's not radical. Jesus disrupts business as usual because he believes all of God's children should have, should have access to the same things that the good citizens of Jerusalem have, need, and want. And that's not radical. What is radical is business as usual that routinely leaves people out. Business as usual that makes profiteering, money changers, and dove sellers essential. Business as usual that preys on the most poor and vulnerable. And as long as that is business as usual, we, we can expect Jesus to cause some Holy Ghost disruption. Which I believe is good news for all of us even if sometimes it makes us uncomfortable. Amen. Let us affirm our faith using the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is, seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, she is worshipped and glorified. She has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Our prayers of the people for Lent are found in your service bulletin. I encourage your own prayers and thanksgivings 
during the silences. Dear siblings in Christ, Christ was crucified in faithfulness for the cause of love and justice, that all might be reconciled to their creator and to each other in peace. Let us pray that his example may be realized in our world and in our lives. As Jesus was lifted high upon the cross, that he might draw the whole world to himself, may we take up our cross and follow him in pursuit of the work of reconciliation in our world. We pray that our Lenten journey of prayer, fasting, and good works may give us penitent hearts, open and receptive to the abundant forgiveness and love of God. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Let us pray for the poor, hungry, neglected, and those who have no choice but to fast every day. Let us pray for an end to the divisions and inequalities that scar creation, particularly the barriers to freedom faced by God's children throughout the world. We pray for our elected leaders and all who serve the common good throughout the world. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Let us pray for an end to the desecration of God's creation, that the fruits of our world might be shared equally with all. Inspire us with wisdom to share the riches of creation that all may be free from poverty, famine, injustice, and oppression. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Let us pray for an end to sickness and disease throughout the world and in our own families, for those who struggle with physical, mental, or spiritual health. O oh God, the strength of the weak and comfort of the suffering, grant your saving health to all who are afflicted by illness, including Larry, Ray, Dennis, Julian, Sharon, Dennis, Denver, Gwen, David, Becca, Dorothy, Barbara, Charlene, Martha, Stephen, Bruce, Jeff, and especially for those we now name. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Let us pray for the departed, especially our siblings who have died as a result of COVID, poverty, hunger, disease, violence, or hardness of human heart. We commend to your mercy all who have died, especially those we now name. We pray that all may share in the joy of your heavenly kingdom. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Eternal God, in your heaven no sword, sword is drawn, but the sword of righteousness, no strength known, but the strength of love. So generously spread abroad your spirit, that all peoples may be gathered together and reconciled under the banner of your love and justice. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us, an offering and sacrifice to God.
The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. And lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. You bid your faithful people cleanse their hearts and prepare with joy for the Paschal Feast, that fervent in prayer and in works of mercy, and renewed by your word and sacraments, they may come to the fullness of grace which you had prepared for those who love you. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy and gracious God, in your infinite love you made us for yourself. And when we had fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, you in your mercy sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Creator of all. Jesus stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself in obedience to your will, a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine. And when he had given thanks to you, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O God, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Recalling Christ's death, resurrection, and ascension, we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit, to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of new and unending life in Him. Sanctify us also, that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace. And at the last day, bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by Christ and with Christ and in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit. All honor and glory is yours, Almighty God, now and forever. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feet. The gifts of God for the people of God, take them in remembrance that Christ died for you 
and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. Hey everyone, thank you so much for tuning in to Trinity for Virtual Church. This afternoon from 2 p.m. to 4 p.m., the church will be opened for you to come and receive the body of Christ in the reserved sacrament. You can come, spend a few moments in prayer, listen to Jeff playing the organ, smell some incense through your mask, of course, and again, partake of communion. We ask that if you do come by, that you will maintain safe social distancing with those who are not in your household and that you, that you wear a mask that covers your nose and your mouth at all times, even if you have been vaccinated. If you would like communion brought to you, uh, you can sign up to have someone come and bring you communion to your home. We just ask that you sign up before noon today. You can find the sign up form on our website at www.trinitycwe.org. Also, I'd like to invite you to virtual coffee hour. It starts at 11.15 and goes until noon. You can also find the link for Virtual Coffee Hour, again, on our website at www.trinitycwe.org. Uh, one more announcement for this week. Starting this week, we are going to, Aaron and I, Reverend Aaron and I, are uh, inviting you to join us for morning prayer via Zoom. Uh, that'll be Monday through Wednesday at 8 a.m., Thursday at 6.30 a.m., I know it's early, and then Friday at 8 a.m. You can find the Zoom link for morning prayer again on our website at www.trinitycwe.org. So if you'd like to join Aaron and I for prayer, again, 8 a.m. on Monday, Tuesday and Wednesday, 6.30 a.m. on Thursdays, and again at 8 a.m. on Friday. Hope you have a great day and God bless.